Hello, everybody. I'm so delighted to welcome you here today for a phenomenal film and discussion and really important event about the story of Martha and Waitstill Sharp, an American couple sent by the Unitarian Church on a very dangerous and daring mission to save children in Czechoslovakia and in France. And I am so delighted to have the filmmaker himself, Artemis Joukowsky, with us today, as well as our very special guest, Amélie Diamant Holmstrom. Before we get to our guests, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Sousa Mendes Foundation and about our upcoming events. The Sousa Mendes Foundation was founded 10 years ago in 2010 by families connected to the remarkable story of the Holocaust rescuer Aristides de Souza Mendez. The foundation was established as a partnership between the hero's own family, the Souza Mendez family, his grandchildren, and families such as my own and others that were rescued by this remarkable hero. Sousa Mendes was the Portuguese Consul General in Bordeaux, France during World War II, and he gave visas to Portugal to allow refugees to escape Nazi-occupied Europe. And that was an escape route that he opened up that then many other, many people were able to uh, follow. Many refugees were able to use, even those that didn't get a direct visa from Sousa Mendes were able to take that escape route. So this year, 2010, is the 80th anniversary of Sousa Mendes's rescue action in 1940. And we had a whole series of events that were planned to mark the anniversary. But unfortunately, we're now in lockdown. We have COVID and all of the plans had to be scrapped. And so in, its, in, in place of these plans, we have been running this series of beautiful stories of hope where we are highlighting not only the Sousa Mendes story, but all of these other beautiful stories of rescue and escape and of life. So let me now tell you about our two upcoming events. And later today, after the program, you will receive an email with links to be able to sign up for those events. Next week, August 9th, we take you to Greece, to a Greek island, where we see the rescue story of a Jewish family by an entire island who kept the secret of this family. And uh, there's a book called Something Beautiful Happened, which was written by the granddaughter of one of the people on the island. And uh, so it's a personal family story that then has repercussions in her own family today. And you can read the description uh, on our website to get more information about what happened to the family. That is a free program. It's unlike most of our programs, which are films. This is actually a book talk. Uh, it's a talk based on uh, this woman's uh, memoirs. Her name is Yvette. Manessis Corporon, and the book again is called Something Beautiful Happened. And Yvette will be interviewed by Miriam Klein Kasanoff of the University of, of Florida um, Holocaust Teacher Institute, University of Miami, excuse me. And um, they are co the Holocaust Teacher Institute is in fact co sponsoring the program next week. The following, in, uh, following week, we take you from Greece, we take you to Italy, and there we're going to be sharing a story called Shores of Light. Shores of Light. Mm -hmm. And if you're familiar with the geography of Italy being itself a boot, then you know that the heel of the boot is over in the southeastern corner of the country, and that is where the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee set up displaced persons camps for people coming right out of the Holocaust. Immediately after the Holocaust, there were several thousand who went to the heel of Italy's boot to these displaced persons camps. 
And that was a time when weddings were happening and babies were being born and the refugees were filled with optimism for the future. They sort of drew a curtain on their past and they looked ahead uh, at the unknown, full of promise. And we're going to be uh, showing a film on that subject called Shores of Light. We have the filmmaker, we have one of the people whose life story is told in the film, uh, who herself was born in one of these displaced persons camps. And we have Mordecai Paldiel, an expert on Holocaust rescue, as well as Natalia Indrimi from the Centro Primo Levi in New York. So that's in two weeks and you won't want to miss that program. And we'll show you uh, a little trailer for that program at the end of today's program. So uh, now we are coming to today. So we're going to together watch a little video where you're going to meet Amélie Diamant Holmstrom and she's going to be seeing her voyage after being saved by Martha Sharp. You're going to see her voyage to America and her experiencing that voyage today through virtual reality. So let's watch this short video together and then you'll meet the star. Have you ever heard of virtual reality? I don't quite understand it. Are you curious to see what it's like? Oh, very. Okay. I'm very curious. I'm Amelie Diamant Holmstrom. I am one of triplets who came to America on the Excambian. Mon Dieu. Oh, mon Dieu. It's beautiful. was to be separated from the parents, but the parents all smile and wave and tell you all is well and you go out into the wild blue yonder hoping for the best. That's amazing. She's absolutely amazing. I didn't know that existed. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it, it, it made the experience very beautiful, actually, you know. of the ones who were separated, you can feel the pain because you see the isolation of the ship in the middle of an ocean. And then eventually you see the Statue of Liberty and you realize that there's some sign of life. I've thought of that statue many times. It's a sign of freedom. It's a sign of hope. It's a sign of possibility. That's what made me so happy. It's my great pleasure to introduce Amélie Diamant Holmstrom, who is a teacher and an author and who has a lot to tell us today. It's my real pleasure to be here because I can share the magic of America, its possibilities, its hopes, its dreams, whatever America has to offer to those who are in trouble. Life for me was in Vienna, a magic experience. I had parents who protected us, taught us wisely how to be kind 
and giving and sharing and every moment of our lives we knew that it wasn't just all about us but about people all over the world then we had the misfortune of the holocaust and everything changed things were very confusing and we were lucky enough to get on the excambion which was a ship that brought single children and i must tell you i am not single i'm one of triplets amelie evelyn and marianne and luckily the three of us were able to experience the, the voyage and to share it with so many single children on the boat. So it was my idea at the time to look at Evelyn and Marion and say, look, we are blessed. We have each other. We have three languages we can speak. Let's each one of us be the mother of one third of the children and let's make them a family so that they too belong and could share and could relax and know someone cared about them and loved them and wanted to share their pain and their joy. We went on the Excambion, Evelyn, Marion and I at the front of the ship because we were triplets and it was kind of a, a, a good show for the boat to have three little girls who were at, them, at that particular time pretty cute to look at the world. And there we were arriving in New York at the Statue of Liberty. I cannot express in words what this moment meant to us. It was a moment of hope, a moment of protection, a moment of sharing and caring, and a moment of magic. We were then, as we were on the, on the boat, taken to Orange, New Jersey. Our, our sponsors at the time were Martha, and with still sharp who were fantastic in giving us courage and hope i do not want to ever forget the power of my good friend artemis jakovsky who filmed all of this and gave us moments of joy and peace and magic if i were in charge the first thing I would do is give him a, a medal of honor because he is such a warm, caring, impossibly wonderful man. He loves the children. He loved his life. He has had many challenges of his own, which he forgot in order to help others. I would give him the star of joy and of mercy and of hopeless, hope, hopefulness, hopefulness for humanity. When we got to Orange, New Jersey, I couldn't believe it. It was so beautiful. There were long, long uh, tables with white tablecloth. Everything was elegant. And we came from a pretty elegant background. So I was extremely comfortable. We waited for the headmistress to lift her, her, her spoon as, as everybody started to eat. Some people have never experienced this, but we were kind of used to that. So I smiled and looked at Evelyn and said, we're home, we're home. At least let's just pray, pray, pray that our parents would come. When we were separated in Marseille from our parents, that was probably the most tragic and painful moment in my life. But we both tried, our parents and ourselves, to smile at each other and wave at each other and pretend it was just a magic 
a magic trip we were going to go on. And you know, God was good to me again, to us again, the three of us. He brought our parents six months later and we went to Portland, Oregon, where my father could be a dentist. My wonderful father, Rudy Papa, he, he was a magic person. He is in my mind all the time. I sometimes close my eyes and there he is in a heart at the, at the heavens and I look at him and I say, Rudy Papa, what you have done, nobody could have done, but you gave us courage and hope and the spirit to survive all the tragic moments of our life. We had each other all the time, as long as we could, with everyone that ever came. I remember one day I went to his office, to my father's office, Dr. Rudolf Diamond, and he had a patient in the chair. And suddenly somebody knocked at the door and a little lady in a babushka came and said, oh, 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 doctor, oh, 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 doctor, I'm in such pain. And my darling Rudy Papa said to his patients, would you excuse me? And he said, what can I do for you? He said, she said, I only have a chicken. I have no money. I'll never forget the way he handled that chicken and if it would be $100,000 and he said to the lady, it's beautiful. And then he handed it quickly to his assistant. Well, he gave so much for free because he believed that all of us have to have a chance of magic and survival. My mother was a wonderful, beautiful woman who, who was a, a violinist. And on our trip, she would play the violin uh, on, on our trip from, not, not, not into, into America, but our trip from Northern Paris to Southern Paris. She would play the violin walking next to us, but Rudy Papa would tell us st stories and keep us from being hungry by saying, let's sing children, let's sing. And we'd all forget that we were hungry till we got to the next Red Cross station. So you see, in so many ways, we were so very, very blessed. To this moment, I feel as if God had a hand in my, in, on my shoulder. Now, I am coming from a, a Jewish Catholic background, but more than being religious, I'm very spiritual because I include everybody. Everybody, every race, every religion, every every uh, uh, way of living, uh, in my in my thoughts, in my prayers, and in my actions, and that's where I'm grateful that our parents have helped us to help others, such as uh, Artemis, to help each other with joy, and with patience, and with magic. We can all create magic. The, the least of us who think that they have nothing are very good people. They just need somebody to pick them up. I am so much against prisons because I think people should have rehabilitation centers instead so that we can lift people's spirits. Not They already pushed down. They haven't had any mentors. Let's help society to lift each other with joy and with pride. We certainly need that today, don't we, Amelie? Oh, so, absolutely. Now I would like to turn to our filmmaker, Artemis Joukowsky, who is not only a brilliant filmmaker, but he's the grandson of Waitstill and Martha Sharp. He has this glorious history, family history on his shoulders. He is also a detective. He can talk to you about how he first learned the story as a child. He's also an activist. He also wrote a curriculum to accompany the film that is now in one million eighth grade classes. I hope I got that right. And uh, he wants to help prevent school bullying through this curriculum. So Artemis, you have so much to say. Please share with us. 
Well, what an honor to be here, Olivia. Thank you for making this incredible program available. And Amelie, I, um, you know, any opportunity to be together is such a joy. Um, we had That's the fun. Mutual. We <laughs> had the fun, uh, the two of us, of uh, dancing in Washington together, celebrating this amazing achievement of this film coming out on PBS. Uh, we were able to be on over 3,500, uh, 3, 500,000 homes that night on uh, uh, August 20th, 1960, uh, uh, 2016. And then as a result of that PBS curriculum and facing history in ourselves curriculum uh, and many other curriculums, we have a wonderful interfaith curriculum uh, done by Meadville Lombard uh, Divinity School. Um, we have now reached uh, over 50 million um, viewers of the film. Um, and I'm very excited to announce that the film will be on a new PBS uh, station for Amazon. So people will be able to see it uh, forever, I hope. Um, but for me, the story came alive as I learned about the story. I was in ninth grade and my teacher, Mr. Pariseau at the Allen Stevenson School in New York, gave me an assignment to interview someone of moral courage. And I came home and I said, mom, who would I interview for moral courage? She said, well, go talk to your grandmother. She did some mm -hmm. very cool things during World War II. And little did I know she had um, evaded the, the Gestapo. She had rescued hundreds of people um, and never told the story. And, um, and for me, it was a, a sense of not just learning the history of, of World War II and what happened during this terrible period, but to also acknowledge that her role was as a, a, a lifesaver, um, a provider of food and medicine to children. Uh, she did everything she could. Um, and, and the most amazing part of the story was to see her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. And, and Eleanor would give to FDR once, once or twice a day a note of what he should do. Uh, and one of the first things he said is, help Leon Feuchtwanger escape, um, which was a very well-known well German Jewish writer uh, who was hiding and uh, Weistel es escorted him to, uh, to the United States. Um, and this, this was part of the, 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 the beautiful legacy of this story is that Amelie and her sisters um, were saved uh, by the Unitarians, not just my grandparents, it was a, a full network of underground activists. My grandparents were just part of um, a major system of the underground. Um, and with the fun of working with uh, Mordecai Paldil, Dr. Paldil, uh, at that time from Yad Vashem, we were able to uncover 440 names uh, of people that they had helped uh, to either directly rescue or support their rescues. Um, and what you learn are the extensive networks of people, um, even in the US government, who um, uh, were trying to do the right thing, um, like Vary and Fry working very closely um, um, with, the, uh, with the State Department um, uh, members in, in Marseille, um, uh, you know, to help people escape. Uh, and it was by any means necessary. And uh, Amelie and her sisters uh, were able to uh, be identified by my grandmother. Uh, her parents uh, came to, to my grandmother and said, can you save, bring my children to America? And she said, of course, we'll do what we can. And uh, it all worked. Um, later that same ship, Excambion was sunk uh, and all the people on that ship were killed. Um, and now we know what my grandparents did that was so unbelievably heroic, given that they were persecuted not only by uh, the, the Nazi and Gestapo officials, but of course, um, you know, when they came to America, they were accused of being communists and uh, very, never really acknowledged until uh, we produced a beautiful ceremony to honor them with, with the president uh, at, the, at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Uh, Ken Burns um, uh, was the, the, you know, the, the, my partner in making this film. And we really had a chance to not just expose what my grandparents did, but 
help produce a show at the Holocaust Museum that is all about um, uh, the, the, the U.S. response to rescue, the, the, the limited number of stories, but the important stories uh, of the Sharps and others. Uh, and now there are just five Americans who are not honored at Yad Vashem. Um, when we started, there were only one person. So this is the beginning, uh, I hope, of more stories that come out. Um, we know that in the case of the Sharps, uh, that there are probably 50 to uh, 60 other Americans that played a role. Um, we will never acknowledge uh, all of them in the same way we did my grandparents, because the, 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 the actual standards of Yad Vashem are very uh, strict, and you have to prove that if you had been caught, you would have been uh, persecuted by the Nazis. There are many rescuers who, who uh, never were acknowledged because that criteria was not used. Um, uh, that criteria was used. So, you know, this is a, a matter of, of, of learning from history. And, and this story for me changed my life. And it allowed me to meet Amelie and her family and produce this film uh, and also do the virtual reality piece, which um, I'm thrilled you saw for the first time, Amelie, today. Very good, very good. I'm so proud of what you do, I cannot tell you. And I want the world to know that you're one of the most wonderful people this side of heaven. Oh. So, um, what an honor to be on this show and um, to be in the tradition of your work, uh, Olivia. Um, I think I think the instinct you have to honor um, Mr. Souza is the same instinct I had to honor my grandparents. Um, for me, I became a better person from this story. Uh, at the time of meeting my grandmother, um, when I did this ninth grade assignment, I also had been diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease called spinal muscular atrophy. And um, I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. I was pretty scared that I would die. Uh, and Martha Sharp came into my hospital room and said, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You to get up and help other people. And it was really through her joy of, uh, at that time, the Girls and Boys Club of New York was a place where I did some tutoring with her. Uh, we also went to all the Hadassah meetings uh, to raise money for, for hospitals in Israel. Uh, and for care of Jewish children. Um, and, and really that period of my life um, was uh, the beginning of becoming who I am today as an activist, a filmmaker, um, and a person who believes deeply in the transformational power of storytelling and storytelling that has truth and meaning for today. And, um, and that's what we need in this, dark period of our lives, uh, dealing with not just COVID, but also um, uh, terrible unrest uh, of our country and, and around the world around a very powerful problem of racism. Um, and racism, as you know, is a big part of the story. Um, racism, not just of, of the persecution of 6 million Jews who were killed, but also of gypsies and of uh, other people of, 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 of different background. And, um, you know, we, we, we are learning from this period of history. Uh, I do want to say, just as an editorial statement, that, um, you know, we have now honored my grandparents each year uh, with uh, an award called the Sharp Rescuer Prize. And that is a prize to help people today doing the work similar to uh, the Sharps and our first award was to Marina Goldman, who is the voice of Martha, but who also was a leading uh, player in, in trying to control and stop Ebola from becoming a worldwide problem. And then of course, um, we have honored uh, Latifa and Colin Woodhouse, who are um, just remarkable partners who saw this film and then decided with their five children to go to Lesbos and start helping uh, Afghani and Syrian refugees um, who um, had had been persecuted by this war in Syria. Um, and, and then our final prize last year was to Angela Merkel for her work um, as a moral leader of the world, in, in our view, uh, for saving over 2 million Syrians and Afghani refugees uh, in the past five years. 
and she's retiring this year. So we had the fun of presenting this award when she was at Harvard last year. Um, and this year we're still debating who, who we believe um, is inspiring us. We have so many um, uh, proposals of, of different individuals and organizations that are saving lives. Um, we're always inspired um, by acts of uh, generous kindness in, in places of, of crisis. Um, and, and I think, you know, clearly the healthcare worker of the world is um, kind of the hero uh, in the Martha Sharp view. Uh, I love it at seven o'clock every night in New York City. People go out and bang their pots and pans to honor uh, the healthcare workers of New York who have, you know, risked their lives to save others. Uh, so that's very much the spirit of, uh, of the Martha and Wastel legacy. Uh, the other beautiful thing is through this process of detective work, we have now collected over 200,000 documents housed largely at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, but at Brown University and Harvard Divinity School Library. We have a collection that spans all the work of not just the Sharps, but all the Unitarians. Uh, and there were many that followed the Sharps. Um, and there's a beautiful book that if you haven't read it by Susan Subeck um, called Rescue and Flight, which is a book about that larger Unitarian story where of course the Sharps are that initial inspiration of be beginning this work in 1939 uh, in Prague and then 1940 in Southern France. But then you go and see the continuation of that work uh, until today. The Unitarian Service Committee is among the most important um, uh, um, uh, activists um, and, and civil rights organizations around the world, supporting workers' rights, uh, supporting the, the, the lives of women, uh, have been active all throughout the world where there have been uh, civil rights abuses um, and, um, and, and are trying to use the human dignity of love to rescue others. And I think this is a story where love is, is really the, the spirit of it. You love people you don't know, you love the world, and you live in that sense of love. And I think my grandmother would argue that um, that kind of love uh, was the best life you could live. You know, was the life of, of uh, as, as Amelie will, will uh, hopefully sing for you, to be a mensch, to be a good person, to be a person who, who loves others uh, and, is, and is, um, you know, is guided by that sense of, of being a good person. So. Now, Artemis and Amelie, there are questions that are starting to accumulate in the chat window, and I do encourage people to start putting their questions in for Artemis and not for Amelie. She would prefer not to be answering questions directly. So Artemis, uh, let me ask you uh, the first question, which is who financed these missions? Well, that's a great question. Um, and, and if you want to learn more, I have a book called Defying the Nazis that describes the detail of that. One of the great things about my grandfather was that he was a, a stickler for these kinds of details. So we know exactly where the money came from. Largely, it was raised by the Unitarian Church in Boston. Um, the Unitarians, for people who don't know, are um, out of the Judeo-Christian uh, history. They don't believe that Christ was necessarily the Son of God, although some Unitarians are very Christian in their orientation. They're more in the ecumenical spirit of Christ consciousness and of the Christ story. And Christ, as you well know, is, was a Jewish carpenter. And so we have to acknowledge the Judeo part of, of the Christian story, uh, which goes back, you know, as the oldest tribe of, that we know of in terms of writing and, and of history. Um, and it's uh, one of these beautiful things that I learned as a young man to understand both the Old Testament and the New Testament and to understand the connection between these stories of faith, of courage, and of history. Um, but I think the most important groups that funded them were individuals. They got a lot of individual donations from um, well-to-do Bostonians, particularly, uh, who believed in, um, in, in, in putting money into charity and in support of others. Um, you know, this story started with the sister church of the Unitarians calling the Boston office and saying, 
don't send us money, send us Americans. We actually need Americans to come here because the only thing the Nazis are afraid of are Americans. And my grandparents came as Americans, very naive of what that meant because everyone thought they were actually the, uh, the consul office of refugees, uh, which they weren't. Um, but what you learn in this story is that um, certain members of the, of the, of the diplomatic corps in, in, in Prague were very helpful to my grandparents to help rescue people. And the British embassy, of course, was very active uh, at sheltering refugees that my grandparents would bring. Uh, this is, of course, after March 15, 1939, the Ides of March, where the Nazis actually invaded Prague and, um, and, and this crisis really came to a head. Um, Artemis, another question for you. Yes. Who did your mother, your grandmother, excuse me, who did she marry in 1957? And it seems from the film that she continued her work with Jewish children. Can you please speak about that? Yes, yes. Well, my, mother, my grandmother well, never had met a Jewish person until she rescued someone. Um, it's kind of an amazing part of the story that she really knew nothing about uh, the background of Judaism until she saw the persecution firsthand. Um, and I think one of the memories I remember her telling me was one day a Jewish family came to her home with their menorahs, with the silver chalice, for all the, 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 the their, their most highly Jewish related um, uh, 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 possessions to say, we can't have these or, or people will know that we're Jewish. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you hold these for us? And I think that opened their eyes deeply uh, to that. She um, and my grandparents divorced uh, in 1955 and my grandmother remarried um, a Jewish man named David Kogan, who was um, um, educated in Boston and went to Northeastern and then was really an investor, became a very successful investor. Uh, so she had the fun with his relationship to be very active in groups like Hadassah, uh, Youth Aliyah, um, you know, organizations that were trying to help children, uh, working uh, actually quite closely with Henry Arizold uh, and other uh, leaders of Hadassah, um, and, and, and spent her life supporting that work uh, until, until she died. So here's a question, which is how did Ken Burns become involved? And I would like to ask you also, how did you get Tom Hanks involved? Well, one, one went to the other. So when Ken Burns uh, first learned of my film, uh, he and I both went to Hampshire College. Um, he was in the first class of Hampshire in 1971 and um, was really my mentor and, and the elder of our community. And when my mother would quiz me why I was going to this uh, innovative, interesting, experimental school called Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, I would say, well, I, I'm, I wanna be like Ken Burns. Um, and that's something she understood. Uh, she saw this bright light of a human being with a beautiful uh, capacity to tell stories. And um, uh, it was very uh, important to her that, you know, I, I have a place to uh, express who I was uniquely. So over the years, I would go to Hampshire reunions and show Ken my film and he would be inundated by hundreds of people uh, giving him DVDs constantly. And he always was so gracious. And, um, and then, uh, you know, in about 2012, 2013, I had finished my version of the film, uh, what I put together. And really the innovation I was seeking was to have Martha and Wastel narrate their own stories. It was very important to me that this not be a third party telling of this history but this be a, a story where Wastel and Martha describe their own experience and you feel like you're with them, almost like Jiminy Cricket on, your, on the shoulder, going with them, seeing these meetings in the rescue. So our, our desire was to shoot even a recreation of a scene uh, to show, to illustrate what it was like for Martha to rescue Mr. X, you know, in the snow, through uh, the snow, check guards after check guards to the British Embassy until they're able to uh, convince the guard that this is Mr. and Mrs. Sharp and she must go in right away. 
uh, and this is how she rescued Mr. X, uh, is to pretend that this man was her husband. Um, and but so the Ken, thing Ken Burns he, went to Tom Hanks, is that it? So what happened was Ken, Ken saw the film and he said, I will help you get this on PBS. It's a stirring story. Um, but I would like um, another, uh, an, a voice of, of someone um, who I think is, would bring di dignity to the role. And he said, what do you think of Tom Hanks as your, as your grandfather? And just like Amelie, mon dieu, oh my God. <laughs> uh, and he, he said, well, I'll call him right away. And before, within three weeks, Ken was in his studio um, mm -hmm. doing the actual recreations of the scenes that my daughter Alexandra actually had found um, through his, his, uh, his memoirs. Ken said to us, because the original film was only 45 minutes, Ken said to us, what do you think of expanding the film to an hour and a half and having more lines said by Waisel, AKA Tom Hanks? I said, let's go. Um, and I think the greatest regret of making this film was that we didn't highlight your story, Amelie, more. Um, we show you on the boat as a young girl with your sisters saying, we're That's so right. happy to come to America. And then we show you at the end of the film um, as, as beautiful um, uh, madams. But we don't, show, we don't show your story. And I think really the VR piece everyone saw earlier was my attempt to go deeper, Amelie, into your family story, largely inspired by you, uh, by your spirit. Amelie has a, a beautiful sense of, of gratitude for my grandparents, but also for all the Unitarians that helped them. Because as I said, there were many, many people that helped them. And many, Emily would never know who, who, who got their, you know, their, their, their initial visas or this or that, because, you know, everyone was involved. But the beautiful thing is Amelie is uh, my inspiration. She has written a beautiful book called The Courtship of Life and how life should be a courtship of love in every moment, in every breath, in every emotion. And you can see that when you meet her, uh, to see her spirit. So, um, you know, so, making, Artemis, people yeah. want to know how they can get the study guide to go with the film. Yeah, go to the Facing History in Ourselves website uh, and look up Defying the Nazis. If you go to my website, Defying the Nazis, uh, the curriculums are all uh, linked there um, and all the different um, uh, partners that are still our partners to this day, like the Holocaust Museum, um, are listed there as well. Um, as as um, Olivia mentioned, Mordecai Paldil, Dr. Paldil, um, he was a singular figure in this process because this man has made it his life mission to go and find as many stories of rescue that he could find. And in America, there was only one American, Varian Fry, who was honored by Yad Vashem. He was among the first to be honored. But Varian Fry, in his own person, didn't want to mention everyone else because it was too confusing to mention all these other people. So my grandparents' story wasn't told until I had the, the fun of telling it. Um, on Amazon, you can also find uh, my grandmother's memoirs. We, we've we've uh, made that available. We are also publishing Ganda de Filia's book um, on my grandmother. It's a very feminist view of my grandmother. And I'm excited to say that we're written a beautiful screenplay by a wonderful writer named Matthew Billingsley. And we are in the process of putting a production for an action packed, you know, uh, summer blockbuster type film uh, where you're, you're actually on the train with Martha and you have to choose how to help. You're not just passively watching the story, but you're kind of in a virtual reality experience. You're, you're part of the solution. Uh, and really my mission as you mentioned about bullying is really to, to talk about rescue and, and being an upstander. And this is the word that's used in the curriculum at Facing History. Um, you know, there, there are four ways that we are in the world. We are, we are sometimes a victim, uh, sometimes we're a perpetrator, sometimes we're a bystander. And then we have this moment in life to be an upstander. And this is a choice. This is not just a, a whimsical thought, oh, maybe I'll be an upstander today. It comes from our spirit of being 
compassionate and loving to others, uh, but it also is our, our anger and our enmity toward evil and to striking it down and to, and to stopping it. And I think my grandparents felt very strongly that, that they weren't gonna fight Hitler with a gun, but they were gonna go oppose him um, by helping people who were his victims. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's really, I think, you know, the beautiful thing about um, what Ken Burns saw in the film, what Tom Hanks saw in the film. Uh, Tom Hanks loved being wasteful. The recording we have of Tom doing the lines um, was quite beautiful. Because I think if you see the story, you also feel the compassion of my mother and what she went through as a child who was left behind. Um, then of course, the sadness of their divorce. Um, and that is a very sad part of the story that in spite of all this beautiful actions they did, their marriage fell apart. Um, and so a lot of redemption in this film, a lot of forgiveness in this film. Um, you know, my mother, uh, my uncle, um, really were very, not just proud of the story, but proud that Ken Burns took this on and that Ken Burns made this his mission to get an audience of 50 million people. I mean, I produced a film before Ken called Two Who Dared that got an audience of 10,000 people. And we thought we were doing very well. Uh, and that's really the difference of uh, a moral compass like Ken Burns is. Um, so there's some curiosity about your family history. So there's a question, did your grandmother convert? And can you share about your grandfather's second marriage? And I'm actually curious to know about the custody battle because your mother says in the film that she said she didn't want to live with either parents. So right. these are personal family questions, but I'm wondering if you can address Yeah, them. I mean, I'm even getting goosebumps as you mentioned that because uh, my wife and I got divorced around the time that I was making this film. And I was also like my grandfather, just heartbroken. And it was something where I had to learn from them, A, that, you know, you can be angry and, and spiteful, but really the the real thing is to love your children um, and to be there for them. And this is a very hard thing to go through. And my grandfather um, moved to Chicago. He became a civil rights activist. He became involved very early in the ACLU's work in Chicago, on the east side of Chicago, helping with uh, integration of African-Americans into the white Polish communities there, coming home with bloody eyes, you know, uh, having been beaten up by people. Um, you know, you look now what's happened in Chicago and how uh, disruptive some of these communities are and you just know that not enough was done, you know, to equalize the playing field for everyone yeah. and to bring humanity to these very distraught places. I mean, when Robert Kennedy went to some of these communities and saw how the other half of America really lived, or not half, 90% lived. You know, it's really uh, something that was horrifying, I think, to my grandfather to, to see the opulence and the, the beauty and arrogance of America, but also to realize that we had limitations in our compassion. Um, so I think, you know, my grandfather uh, and my grandmother divorced in 1955. He was living in Chicago. At that time, my grandmother was doing a lot of fundraising for Hadassah and Youth Aliyah. She was all over the country. Um, she was you know, a political figure uh, as well in the Democratic Party. So she was very active in, 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 in trying to uh, increase immigration, but then she became a target of McCarthyism. So that became part of uh, her defense of the Unitarian work. There were many Unitarians that were accused. One most famous story is Noel Field uh, was accused of being a communist and actually went to Hungary and became uh, a house under house arrest under Stalin um, uh, and, and died that way. So there were obviously a lot of tensions around communism. Many of the people they rescued were accused of being communists like Leon Feuchtwanger. Um, um, and, you know, so this was a tension that she managed all her life. But the most beautiful thing about my grandparents is that they, they never stopped their belief in what people could do to help each other. And even though they had this terrible divorce uh, that really broke up the family and, and my grandfather felt very deserted by my grandmother, um, they both found love 
uh, a second time around in their lives. And that love was the love I experienced. And one of the reasons why no one ever told the story is that both grandparents married other people that were tired of hearing what they had done with the other grandparent. So no one ever talked about this because it was so, you know, upsetting in a sense. Um, just, just constantly mentioning this other person. Um, and so really what had happened is both grandparents started telling the story almost as individuals, not to include the other person and really forgetting the role. And one of the things I was so excited to do in this film was to show what a married couple could do together, what a husband and wife could do, what people who are committed to each other could do. And then when they fall apart, what are the consequences of that and how, how hard that is? So this was, you know, in my own life, it was my own DNA, it was my own family story. So by making this film, I also was curing my own sadness and my own feeling of, of uh, betrayment that, my, that members of my family felt toward each other and to allow forgiveness. Um, and I think that is ultimately the most powerful part of storytelling is the emotional intelligence that it gives us, the emotional release that it allows us and, and the forgiveness to moving, to moving to a new place of understanding that everyone did their best. You know, even though my mom was abandoned, she was saving other children. And, and, and in her mind, she was doing my grand, my mother proud that she was saving children like her. Um, so. so before we get to our final thoughts, this hour has just flown by. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, the trailer for the program we're doing in two weeks. It's the film called Shores of Light. Beautiful. So I wanted to have you, give you the opportunity to see this trailer and encourage you all to sign up. Beautiful. Most, most of our programs are free programs or very uh, minimal cost. But uh, every, every once in a while, we do do a ticketed event. This will be a ticketed event, and but it's a donation of any amount. You can choose what you're comfortable to give. And these ticketed events have the function of being able to support all the events that uh, we are presenting, even the free ones. So uh, it, it really helps us out. We're a nonprofit organization, and it's also a, um, I think going to be quite a very special program. So Matthew, I'm going to ask you to share the, um, the trailer and then we'll have some final thoughts. Amen. כולם היו בהיריון, כולנו, אני חושבת. זו הייתה התשובה של מי שניצל לעומת כל מה שהוא סבל קודם. בסנטה מריה דה לאוקה, בדיוק, בדיוק מול ה, הבית חולים ומול ה, <מגדלור> המגדלור. <מגדלור> הנה, את שומעת, רבקה ושוני פה על ידי מתרגשות <מגדלור> כמעט כמוני. מיליוני פליטים נותרו חסרי בית, ביניהם מאות אלפי יהודים שרוצים להגיע לארץ ישראל. אבל שערי הארץ סגורים בפניהם על ידי שלטון המנדט. הם חיים מחוסר ברירה במחנות המכונים מחנות העקורים. contenitori ‫הוא בורטה בקאסה נושטרה, ‫כאלה נאונדי צ'ופרסונה, ‫הם מנג'אבנה. ‫לאטרה, שתי בריאו, ‫פזיונו דלה מרצ'ה זו לטורליה, ‫זו בשביל הרמאריה, נו. ‫כל לגנדלינה קנטאונו, ‫לילי קנצוני, ‫או בן תשע, לא מלא גאה, ‫מי מנהל פיאלטון? ‫זה פיצה. 
Noventa y salo, 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 malecum. Es que es con ella. Con la picolina, ella. Ella. No, 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 no. ella. Ella. Es nata. Es nata la colonia, mamá. No, no, sono sposati anche qua nel 46 quante ne sono sposate? ho iniziato a stare da un momento che ho iniziato a stare ho iniziato a stare ho iniziato a stare ho iniziato a stare che è l'età ragionata אחרי הימים האלה, אחרי השנים האלה של המבואים. כן, אחרי כל מה שהיא אמרה, כן. שזה בעצם, היה יום כל כך מאושר. זו הייתה חמיליה, זו הייתה חמיליה, זו הייתה חמיליה, זו הייתה חמיליה. È una grande lezione che viene da questo piccolo pezzo di terra. Great, so you'll have an opportunity to sign up for that program uh, when you get the email from us later this afternoon. So now let me turn back to our two wonderful special guests today and ask uh, if one or both of you would like to share some final thoughts with us. I do. Please. I want to sing with you, be a mensch. A mensch is a total human being. It's a song written and composed to know that we all belong to the world universe. Be a mensch, be a mensch, be a mensch. Oh, a mensch is a person who is knowledgeable and kind, who is competent and honest, who speaks his mind, who knows who he is, who leads his best life, regardless of age, 90 or 5, be a mensch, be a mensch, be a mensch. Oh, a mensch is a person who cares and who shares, respects racial, sexual orientations, religion, the healthy, the disabled, the rich and the poor, as he reflects that friendship and unity are the essence of life. Be a mensch. Be a mensch, be a mensch, and for the everybody, mensch, being a mensch, being a mensch. The world that is free to enjoy life's magic and harmony. A mensch is a person who spreads courage and hope. Be a mensch, be a mensch, be a mensch. And I'd like particularly, again, to give credit to Artemis, who is the total Wow, Artemis, you're well, next. I just want to bring it all the way back to you, Olivia, and thank you for making this program happen and for hosting us. And all of you can't see Matthew, but behind the scenes is a, a little Wizard of Oz making all this happen. Matthew, thank you so much. And uh, Amelie, I love you with all my heart. Thank you that for being my ways. man. I have such respect for you. Love you so much. Good. Well, how can I thank you enough, our two uh, fantastic special guests, and uh, certainly all of you who've given us an hour of your time. Thanks for being with us, and we hope to see you on our upcoming programs. And let me not forget to say a word of that wonderful lady called Olivia, who has spent time and, 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 and love and sharing and caring with us we are very, very proud of you. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. Thank you. And thank you all. Have a nice rest of your day, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.